How you doing, Reggie Bibb? Uh, this is for my leadership practicum class. I'm with uh, one of our new teachers here, Mr. Alexander, and we're both special education teachers. Uh, we teach resource math, and we also do inclusion. And we also have a caseload. And so what we're going to do today is our uh, our SPED director has asked me to meet with him and discuss, you know, our district's policy and more important, our school's policy on how to to write effective labs and effective goals for our special education students. Um, so I guess we're just going to get started. Got Mr. Alexander right here. Say how you doing, Mr. Alexander? Hey, how's it going? Okay. He's a, he's a great teacher. He comes over from Dallas ISD, but he's, he's new to our campus. So, uh, you know, just different, different schools and different, different districts have different policies. So today we just got to kind of go over our policies as far as uh, how we want to write effective plans and goals for our kids. All right, so what I've done is I've created a, a little PowerPoint that we can use to just go through and to go through how we do things at Wiley ISD. Um, so I've got a list of nine different steps, I think, that are really important. Check your FIE for the disability. Um, when getting the R notice, checking the kids' grades and getting a snapshot of their progress. Speaking with the teachers, speaking with the parents, speaking with the kids about how they feel the progress is being made. Um, then we also want to see how the disability is affecting academic and functional behavior. Then we want to make sure we gather good, effective, and appropriate data um, for our students. Um, and then we want to talk about how, then we want to get into actually creating the actual PLAF based off the data that we've gathered from, from teachers and from, from the students and from uh, the FIE and from, you know, the grade book and, and previous uh, state assessments. And then we want to use that data to create the goals, the data and the PLAF to create the, to spe the specific goals to the kids. And we always want to finish up by talking to the student and the parent about the goals, make sure they're on board with it, make sure they understand what it is exactly that their role in the student's success. So that's just kind of have a brief overview and what we'll do is we'll just kind of hit each one of these little things. All right? Okay. All right, well first off, um, uh -huh. you know, for being someone that's uh, maybe new to this concept, uh -huh. uh, what actually is a PLAF? All right, a PLAF is pretty much, um, it's, it's how the students perform in the classroom. In the classroom and in the general, in just in the general school setting. So it deals with the academic achievement of the student and then the functional behavior of the student. So how is the kid performing in the classroom? How are their grades? Do they have an academic success? And also how is the kid behaving in the classroom and in the school? So it's just pretty much a snapshot of how the kid's doing in school. Does that make sense? Okay. It's a great question. And anytime you have any question, then please, please feel, don't hesitate to ask. Um, and I apologize, but our, I'm getting a glare on our computer, on my video. So it's affecting my screen. So I might have to come through and, and adjust the font on my screen. But um, the first thing I always do, the first thing we always do whenever we have an R coming up, and really at the beginning of every school year, once you get your caseload and once you get a, a, a new student or any kind of, anytime you're dealing with a kid, is you want to check the FIE and you want to figure out what that kid's disability is. Because that's where it all starts with our kid. You know, they're in special education for a reason. And so we want to identify what that disability is, first and foremost. Like, I know you have an art coming up with Andrew Mason, correct? And so what I did was I wouldn't pull his most recent FIE. It's funny, man. I, I know Andrew. I'm on, I've known Andrew for about three years now. And so I knew him at a previous school. I've seen his progress at this school. So I know some of the, some of the strengths and weaknesses of Andrew. <laughs> you know, he's a, he's a special kid, you know, to say the least. Um, but what we see is... And in SFIE, we scroll down right here on the front page, it says that uh, he received special education services for OHI, which is other health impairment, due to a diagnosis of ADHD. So that's Andrew's deal. That's his, that's his disability. Right? That's, that's his lead is he has ADHD. And then from there, you know, you already know the kid. You know, he's got him in class. Um, and you know a kid like Andrew, he's had some issues in school. And so we can already start to see where some of those issues come from in terms of the disability. Like what, you have Andrew in class, correct? So what, 
what do you what are some of the things that you see from him in class? Um, well, for one, of course, his intense his attention level is not at a normal level. Yeah. Um, it's hard for him to really focus on what we're doing in class. So it's the process of really trying to get him motivated to stay on task, attempt the work, and really sort of just engage in the process. Um, you know, when you deal with individuals such as we do, you know, it's, a, it's hard to motivate them. You know, and then when you look at why they're not motivated based upon maybe their disability, or it could be something else. Um, so finding that, trying to fine tune that to determine whether it's their disability or it's something different, and then focusing on that and trying to, to mold that into something that's going to be productive uh, when you're dealing with those two factors. Because you don't want to allow a student to not reach their full potential because of something other than what they're struggling with. So it's really just trying to hone in on the ones that are outside of and I think that's huge, man. Don't want a kid not to reach his full potential because of a disability that he might not, probably not, cannot control. You know, if a kid doesn't want to come in and do the work, that's one thing. And we got to try to meet and motivate the kid. But if the kid has a diagnosed disability, and that's keeping him from having academic success, and that's where the plaques come in. That's where the goals come in. So we want, to, we want these kids to have success. We want to create an environment to where we're doing everything we can to help these kids have success. And I think that was, that was huge, man. That was definitely good stuff. Uh, so we check the FIA for the disability. That's first and foremost. And then from there, again, I'm going to have to um, so make some updates on my PowerPoint so we can make sure it's getting seen on the camera. So from there, once we get that R notice, I like to check Skyward immediately to get a snapshot of the progress and what he's doing in class. It's like, you know, I check Andrew's grades as we come in and like, well, so what, what, what is he making in your class right now? Uh, right now, he's at a low 60. You know, and it's, it's more based upon really the effort yeah. that we put in the class, um, doing the work, doing the science in class. Um, you know, I really don't focus too much on homework, focus on classwork, because uh, as these kids, uh, you know, the things that they deal with, and they have other classes, so you do, don't really want to bombard them with a lot of extra homework. You want to focus more on being able to cover the information during class, give them opportunity to ask questions, uh, to keep that motivation and yeah, that drive going through the process, because it's so easy for them to say, I don't understand this stuff I'm having to do. So trying to keep it within the classroom is what I strive to do, to be more focused and allow them to ask questions and try to gauge where they're really at. So that's good. Really home. That's good. I think that's, I think that's really good stuff. Uh, that I actually click to the next slide because you gave a lot of good input on what I would talk about next is definitely speak with the teachers about his progress. Because Skyward, you know, that's a great indicator on student success and achievement. It's not the only indicator. You know, depending on the, the, uh, the period of a grading period when you catch them, uh, they might have just taken a really tough test. They might have taken a really easy test and might inflate the grades a little bit. I think it's important to make sure you get that snapshot of, of, of the grade book because that's a, a great way to communicate students' success and progress in the classroom. But uh, you, you also have to speak with the teachers about their progress as well. So that all goes hand in hand with... Uh, Trying to find the data for your kids. How y'all doing? Are oh, you come on in? Come on in. You come on in. Come on in. Come on in. How you doing today? Am I? I'm the sub for you. Come on in. Come on in. We actually share a classroom with Miss Hatcher. Uh, 
You can come on in. We're actually. Go right ahead with what you're doing. I get real here. Won't bother you. Not, you're not a problem it's at all. It's been an experience over here this morning. I, I bet it has. Yeah, yeah bet it has. but. Yeah, come on in. Make yourself welcome. We Thank just. You so very much. Just so you know, we're, we're actually filming a little video for a master's class. Go right out. You, you're more than welcome. I'm fine. Okay. And so, yeah, I think it's important to look at the grades, to speak with the teacher, to see what they see, like what you're talking about. And then I think it's also important, too, to. Uh, Call home and speak with the parents, and uh, see what they see. Cause you know, it's you want to get a comprehensive view of what a kid, what a kid has going on. Grade book is one part of it. What you see in the classroom, how they engage with the students, how well they're working, how engaging in the lesson is one thing. And then also, man, these kids, you know, they have lives outside of school as well. And so you want to make sure you get a taste of that. Like I know Andrew, man, he's got a lot going on at home. You know, I know he lives with mom. I know he has some issues there. Um, Dad is kind of in and out. Those are some issues as well. This kind of kind of weighs on them. And so, man, when you when you really look at the home life of these kids, I think a lot of times that also dives into why a kid might or might not be having the level of success that we know he can have. So that's the next step is is maybe she call call parents. You always want to keep parents in the loop on what's going on, especially with our special needs kids, especially with the kids who who might need a little bit more hands on effort, man. Because because first of all, you don't want a parent to get surprised. You know, the last thing we want is the greater period to come up and, you know, parent, Andrew's going home talking about I'm doing great, and all of a sudden he comes home with a failing grade. When, throughout this grading process, we can be communicating with parents, hey, this is what's going on with Andrew. What do you see at home? How can we work together to make sure he's having academic success? How can we work together to make sure he's having success, you know, just in general? So, that's the next piece of it. So, what's your, what's your take on the frequency of these call home? Now, for me, I know at the beginning of the school year, you know, the communication starts. Yeah. Uh, whether it's a phone call, yeah. it's an email, something of that nature, just to introduce and say, you know, uh, who I am, what my expectations are, uh -huh. and then go from there to build that relationship. But once that initial contact, then how frequently is, is that shift? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I don't like to put a guideline on. I don't like to put a set guideline on it. I like to fill it out. But one guideline I do try to keep on it is every three weeks, I always look and see who's passing and who's failing. If I have a kid who's failing, then I like to reach out to mom and let her, mom and dad, and let them know, hey, this is what's going on in the classroom. Andrew's got a, you know, he, he felt his, his last couple of tests and his, he's got a couple of zeros in his assignments. I just want you to understand what's going on in the classroom. Is there anything that I can do to better help Andrew have success? Is there anything he can be doing at home to better help him have success? So I kind of feel it out. And anytime a kid starts struggling, anytime a kid starts taking a dip, I'm, I'm, I'm usually pretty quick on picking up their phone or sending home an email just saying, hey, this is what's going on in school. And from there, a lot of it honestly depends on how receptive the parent is. You know, when I got parents that are, that are really receptive and want to hear back from me and they're, they're quick to reply, I love to keep that in line of communication as open as possible. You know, it does make it a little bit more difficult when you're reaching out to parents and, and you don't get a response back. And so then, then my, my, my level of communication tends to become a little less frequent. But I always try to hinge on the fact that if my kids don't have an academic success, no matter what kind of response I'm getting, I'm going to reach out and try to reach home and do the best I can just to provide uh, a net, a big net around these kids, make sure they have success. So, and if I look up, you know, the grading period ended for us last night, last last week. So I looked up and said, all right, I got two of my kids that are failing. So I just sent a quick email home to those parents saying, hey, Johnny's failing because, and then these are some of the areas that she needs to work on, or these are some of the tests that they can retake, or this is what they can do to bring up the grades. This is what they're struggling with, just something like that. Uh, just trying to keep those lines of communication open. So I think the most important thing is you want the parents to know what's going on, and I think you also want them to know that they have somebody that's going to advocate for their kid at school and somebody they can trust. And I want to be that person for them, especially for our kids. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question? Yeah. So, reach, so we got, you know, check the grades, talk to the student, talk to the parents, talk to the teachers.
All right, so from there, we've got a pretty good view on what the kid has going on in school, <clears throat> in terms of academic success, and well, now we want to see how the disability is affecting the student's academic and functional behavior. So we got a good snapshot of, of what they have going on in school. We talked to parents about what's going on at home. So now let's look at this disability and see how is it affecting Andrew, in this case, or our students, academic and functional behavior. So we look at the ADHD. You kind of hit on it earlier, but how is the ADHD? Is the ADHD affecting his academic uh, success? And how is it affecting his academic success? In terms of your classroom? Well, it can, it does, but I think there's other factors also that okay. need to be addressed. Uh, you know, the focus part, if then, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are other, other things that can strew the data to say, okay, it's about that when it's really, it's not. It's just more about a decision. Yeah. Making a decision to do things, something other than the academic. So, when we're looking at, you know, the grades, come on, right up. I'm gonna write this down. Is that okay? Uh, I'm listening. So, you know, there are other factors that you know we, we look at when we're talking about academics. You're talking about behaviors. Uh -huh. Talking about focus. Um, and just general want. Um, you know, when you're looking at look at a certain kids, if you have to look at that environment in which they live in. And that environment can dictate and sort of alter their behavior. Uh -huh. uh, they could come in because of something that occurred at home and their attitude is just not good. It's not focused on learning. And so therefore, can't really say, okay, because he has ADHD, that's why he's not focused. His focus has nothing to do with his disability folks have to do with his environment and the things that are going on in his life. And so those can alter how successful he is. Yeah. You know, even normal kids, well, I'll say normal, but kids that don't have learning disabilities, yeah. they can also be affected by their environments. I agree and with that. So you can't say, okay, well, it's their learning disability, well, they don't have a learning disability. Yeah. So you have to sort of tend to look at these kids, uh, look at them as gen ed students first and then look at their disability and see if it's uh, some type of altering behavior there because sometimes it can just be the environment and experience versus yeah. their actual disability. I agree with that completely. So now let's look at this. Cause so for our FIE, for our, I mean for our class, we got we to gotta tie their success to their disability. And we got to try to get rid of the outside factors, and we got to hone in specifically on how is Andrew's ADHD affecting his academic success. So, do you see areas where his ADHD is affecting his academic success? Yes, there, right. there's definitely you know, a particular concepts that um, can be addressed in order to try to help him be more academically savvy and academically successful. Got you. And so that's when. And that's something that I would always talk to, especially all of his core teachers about. You know, what do you see? You know, Andrew, of course, you know Andrew Mason. I talked to you about him earlier. He has ADHD. Where is his ADHD? Is his ADHD affecting his academic success? And then where is it affecting his academic success? And when I do that, I try to go in. I'm a, I'm a note taker. I like to journal. And so when I go in and have conversations with these teachers about that kind of stuff, I let them know, hey, I just want you to give me your heads up. I'm going to be taking some notes so I don't forget. I want to make sure I'm doing everything the best I can for my students. Um, and so I just kind of preface that and then let them know, I'm a, you know, let them know I'm going to be taking notes and then we try to hone in on specifically how the ADHD is affecting his, his learning. And then from there, we also just talk about his behavior. I know Andrew's got some behavior issues. When you go in and talk to the teachers, make for sure we try to separate the behavior from the disability. Does that make sense? I know with a lot of our kids, with most of our kids, it's, it's blurry lines because, like you said, it could be his ADHD kicking in. It also could be the fact that he's got a lot going on at home. So we just want to try to find patterns of behavior and see if we can tie as much of that to his ADHD to help him when we start building this plot, especially when we start building his goals. It's just trying to decipher between, all right, what is just lack of motivation? What is just behavioral issues? What is just, 
you know, generic discipline issues versus what is specific learning disability issues and how it's affecting you. So that's just one thing that you want to think about as well is, and that's probably one of the biggest things you want to think about is how is a disability affecting his academic and functional behavior. And then from there, and as we're doing this, we're just collecting that data, we're taking our notes. Um, I mean, this all goes along the same lines of, you know, gathering data. Gathering Skyward data, which is our grade book, getting data out of AWARE, which is where we see our standardized test scores. Um, we get, and they showed you the teacher input forms that they like to send out? Uh, I've seen a glimpse of them, but I we got one that we can look at. I don't have a copy of it right now, but what we have is our, our, um, our special education secretary, whenever we have an art coming up, she sends out a notice to all of his teachers. And what she does is she also includes an attachment of a teacher input form. And on that teacher input form, it has just different questions and stuff we talked about, about um, about his behavior in class, about his, his, success, his academic success in class. And so that's also a good uh, a good point of data. You know, talk about talking to parents. You also want to talk to the student, man. Hey, how's it going in math class? You know, how's it going in English class? I see you. I see you have a 71 in math, and I see you have an 85 in Spanish. What is it about Spanish is that helping you have success that we're not getting in math class? So just talking to the teachers. And then also, I man, I like sitting down with the kids and going to their classrooms and just observing their behavior and observing what they have going on in the classroom. So it's just, we just, on this campus, man, we're really big on, on trying to gather as much data as possible uh, to try to get a, an overall, very comprehensive view of what's going on in our students' lives. So, so we move on to the next part. <clears throat> so after we got a lot of our data, then we go to uh, we get into creating the plan based on the information that we got. Um, And from there, we go on to using the data and the plan to create the goals for our students. One thing we're, we, we do as a, as a district and as a campus is, if they're in resource, it is district policy to create a subject goal for that student. So Andrew, I know he's in resource geometry. And so we make sure that we give him a subject-specific goal for geometry. If he's in resource English, we'll do the same thing there. Now we have several kids who might be in resource math and let's say resource English, but they might be in the general education classroom in history and in science. So we don't necessarily have to write a goal for those classes they're in general education classroom for, whereas we do have to write the goals for if they are in the resource classroom setting. Now can you write a goal for a kid that's in the general education setting? Yes, of course you can if it's needed. But that's just kind of on a needs basis based off the data, based off the star scores, based off of what the teacher sees based off of what the parent sees and based off of what the student feels is best for them. So, okay. so say you uh, you obtain a teacher input form, uh -huh. but when you look at the form, there's nothing that references academic. How where do you go from there? How do you now create a goal based upon a teacher saying, "Well, he doesn't come in with that." Okay. How does that relate to the actual? the subject matter that's being taught because you're not really getting a, a snapshot of academically where he's at. You're only getting the behavior part of it. So where do you go from that point? I think, man, it's so important to have relationships with these teachers, especially when our kids are in their classrooms. And it's a, because when you, you're going to get a lot of those teacher input forms that are like that. They just aren't comprehensive enough and aren't giving the data that you need to help this kid have academic success. And so it's important to have that relationship so you can go in there and say, hey, now thank you for giving me a teacher input form. How is he doing in English right now as far as academically? I, and you know, I, go, I like to go in there and just be honest with teachers. Like, I know Andrew or I know Johnny or I know Sarah has her issues from a behavior standpoint. I know that and I'm working with her on that. But from an academic standpoint, I need to know how she's doing and how I can, how we can help her have academic success. 
So just going in and talking to these teachers and letting them know, man, that I'm going to be an advocate for this kid. I want this kid to have success. I'm going to help you and help in, in, in getting the most out of this kid from a behavior standpoint, but I also need to make for sure that we're getting everything we can out of this kid from an academic standpoint. Does that make sense? So I like to just go in and I'll go in and talk to a teacher. When I get a teacher input form and I see it, it might be something great on there. Like, hey, man, I see you. Andrew's doing really well in your class, and I just want to thank you for, for really working with him because he didn't have a lot of class and he's having a lot of academic success. Thank you for that. On the same end, I got a teacher who is strictly behavior. Hey, man, I see Andrew's really struggling in your class. What can I do from a behavioral standpoint and from a relationship standpoint to help Andrew be better for you in your classroom? Oh, he, he does this, he does this, he does that. Okay, I'm going to work with him on that. Can you do me a favor? What does he do well academically? What does he struggle with academically? Because I also need to make for sure, not only is his behavior on point, I need to make sure he's in class and he's learning. And so just building relationships with teachers so that they know you're going to do the best you can from a behavior standpoint to create a, a good environment for them to have success as teachers and instructional. But at the same time, let them know, man, hey, what can we do to make sure this kid's having academic success? And I think it takes a village to raise all these kids, especially the kids that we're talking about. And so just letting teachers know, man, that, that we're in this thing together. And whatever I can do to help, that's what we're here for. That's their case manager. You know, that's part of, that's a big part, one of the biggest parts of our of our roles is making sure that they're doing everything academically and behaviorally. Does that, does that answer your question? Relationships, man. Relationships and talking. Um, and then from there, we talk to the student and the parents about their goals. Making sure that they understand what the goals are, making sure they understand the expectations, making sure that they both, the student and the parent, understand their role in academic success and goals. Making sure they understand what my role will be, what each of the teachers' roles will be, because like I said, this is, this is all of us. We're all in this thing together. Not just the student, not just the parent, not just us, not just the teacher. It's everybody working together. So that's just kind of a background on what we need to do. Um, so like you said, gathering the data for the class, FIE. We use AWARE. Have you been able to get into AWARE? And really dig into the data? Good, good, good. So so, like where I, uh, where I came from, we actually used the actual star scores to really Good. push our plot because that standardized testing shows exactly because it's broken down into different teams, uh -huh. different parts, so different objectives, so you know exactly which ones are struggling with stuff. And with those, we can create the plot, but the problem with that is the date. Yeah, and last year's, not this year's. Uh -huh. So don't get a concrete present level, but you get uh, more of a historical level. Yeah. And that can work in some instances. Other instances, it can. Yeah. But that's what we, we sort of hone in on and realize that because it's consistent. Yeah. Versus, you know, like we just talked about the teacher input, we know information. Yeah. So at least with that, that's more of a concrete. You can see that and we can move forward and stuff. In your last district, when y'all wanted to aware, of course we have star score data on there. But did y'all do did y'all do um, unified district assessments in your last district? Yeah, we did. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Because that's we also had that data probably like your last district. We had that data in aware. So like you said, that star stuff. These are the historical data. I know, like in algebra one, we gave a district checkpoint two weeks ago. We're giving another one this Thursday, and so that'll give a little bit more up to date data. And then I like to combine that. That aware data with our Skyward data, which of course is in complete real time. And so kind of combining those two things gives a really good snapshot on, like you said, the SCs that they that they that they have strengths in and weaknesses in from an academic standpoint. Of course, like we said, get the teacher input. And then man, I, I can't stress this enough, being around your kids more and more, being in the classroom with the kids and just kind of observing, seeing what their behavior is like. You know, our kids, coach, that teacher just don't like me. Yeah, but what did you do for that teacher not to like you? Are you coming in every day prepared? Are you coming in every day with your pencil and your pen in your hand? You have you have your you have your school supplies every day. Are you listening? Are you being attentive? Are you sitting in the back with your head down? Are you in the front? And so just observing these kids and their natural behavior, in their natural habitats in the classroom, I think is is very, very important. So not just taking their word for it. And sometimes, you know, not even just taking the teacher's word for it. Just really seeing what's going on. 
Uh, so, like I said, in the FIE, we get what the disability is, how and how it might affect his or her academic success and behavior. So, like we said, with ADHD, you know, we we tend to see a lot of times, you know, of course, just kids can't can't stay focused. Kids off task. Kids off task during the, during the lesson. Kids off task during the during the practice. So, when we talk to these teachers, you know, you know, Andrew has ADHD. How on task is he? And then we also like I like to tell them, you know, I give them a a tally mark, tally mark system. So I want you, can you just do me this favor? While you're doing instruction, can you just look at Andrew? And every time you look at Andrew, if he's paying attention, can you just put a circle on his face? If he's not paying attention, can you put an X on his face? You don't have to call him out, don't have to address him, just can you just do that? So at the end of that instructional le instructional period, I get to see, you know what I mean, how many times was he on task versus off task? And the same thing, maybe the next week, can you do that while he's doing individual work? And that gives us another just good data on whether or not he's able to be attentive and staying on task. So that's the FIE part and how that can kind of dig into his behavior. Of course, academic academic success. When we write, when we start writing that plaque, um, what does the student do well? And what areas does the student struggle? How does a disability affect these areas? It's important, man. How does a disability affect the learning? Not necessarily how does his behavior affect the learning, but how is a disability affecting his behavior that's affecting the learning. Um, <clears throat> so what I have right here is kind of a sample plaf. And what I started off with is, you know, the FIE. Student XYZ is currently a ninth grade student with an OHI disability diagnosed with ADHD. Based on the FIE dated, she scored poorly in the areas of age-appropriate attention span and following directions independently. And I put some general information from the FIE and from teachers. She does well with making eye contact, usually has a happy disposition, and responds appropriately to praise and correction. She is currently a resource math and is a general education setting in the English, social studies, and science with inclusion support. So what I like to do is just kind of give a brief background on this student, how she kind of is and what her, what her disability is. Then from there, I kind of go into her strengths and I go into her weaknesses. Um, this right here in particular is pulled off from, from the STAR scores. So she has strengths in numerical representations and relationships and computations and, and computations and relationships. And these two are areas of weakness on geometry and measurement and data analysis and personal financial literature. One little thing that I always try to do, and anytime I write about a student, I always start off with their strengths. I always start off with something good. I always start off with the good news. I don't know, just, you know, a lot of times when our kids, we call our parents, a lot of times it's something bad. Like, Andrew did this, Andrew did this, Maddie did this, Maddie did that. But I always like to start off with something positive. Try to get the parents on our side. Let them know, man, I really do care about your kid. Because I'm sure a kid like Andrew, you know, he's probably his whole life, his mom's got bad phone calls. And so I like to be the person to say, you know what, Andrew's doing really well in class. We had to work on this, but he's doing really that's, that's how I always want to start off my FIE. It's kind of a general, I mean, start off my plot. It's a general background information on what that student is doing as a person and then strength and weaknesses. And then from there, I really dive into teacher input and I really dive into the data as far as how she's doing grade wise in class. As a result of her ADHD, this student has trouble staying on task doing instructional and independent work. But that's not enough just to tie in her behavior and her abilities to ADHD, you're gonna to need to tie in some data to support it. So one piece of data, like I said, is just doing a tally system. Um, this student needs to be erected 10 to 15 times per class based on teacher observation. So I have this student in class. So once a week, I'll just kind of see, I'll kind of mark how many times I have to redirect her. I'll ask a couple of other teachers, I'll ask a core teacher to do the same thing for just once a week, one class period, can you just mark how many times you have to redirect this student? Because this has been a diagnosed, proven, documented issue with her. Um, and then I try to put on there some of the things, some of the accommodations that we've seen that might have success or have had success with her. Giving her preferential seating to minimize distraction has helped her manage her behavior. When allowed to sit where she wants, it has been observed that she needs to be directed 10 to 15 times per class. With preferential seating, her number of times needing to be redirected is dropped seven to ten times per class. And so when we do these plots, it's just part of building that relationship with the kids and the students. 
we don't just get collect data when it's our time. We collect data all year long. Pick up the phone, hey, how is Andrew doing right now in class? Well, he's been off task a lot these last couple of weeks. How much has he been off task these last couple of weeks? Well, I don't know, but I've had to tell him a lot yesterday. He needs to sit down and be quiet, or he needs to get back to his work. Well, can you do me a big favor? Tomorrow, when he comes into class, every time you have to redirect him, can you just put a tiny mark down? Or can you just email me how many times you needed to redirect him? And I want to talk to him about that. You know, so I do that, you know, once a week, once every other week, just try to get some of that data. And the next time I say, hey, what, what if you move him to a different part of the classroom? How does that affect him? Could you do that for me? Could you move him to a different part of the classroom, move him to the front of the class, and then can you do it for me? They say, and let's see if it goes up or down. If, it, if the number of times he needs to be ready to go on, goes down, well, that's an accommodation we probably need to put into his FI, I mean, into his IEP. Does that make sense? So just, just trying to figure out what's best for these kids, really, and then just document as much of that as possible. Um, I'll give you a documentation form as far as how we can write our FI, I mean, our plabs. I like to write them in paragraph form, in story form. They also say that you can also do it just by listing it. So where I kind of write about it in story form, you can just write, you know, you need to be directed 10 to 15 times per, uh, per science teacher. When given preferential treatment, you need to be directed 7 to 10 times per science teacher. So there's different ways you can document and write it. It's just you need to have the, di the disability, you need to have the accommodations, and you also need to have some data to support. Sound good? And from there, once we created our plaf, we need to use the data and the plaf to start creating our goals. continue this later. I know the bill is getting ready to ring. We're going to start having students come in. Um, but that's a good start. It's kind of on how we create the plaques. What I have, like I said, I'll give you a documentation form on. I have all this stuff written down. I have some example plaques for you. And I hope this helps. Um, like I said, but we'll, we'll continue to meet. It's all about building relationships with kids. So we'll continue to meet. Some more stuff. All right, I appreciate you. What are you going to say?